I want you to go to page 74 in your workbook. We have designed our time together around small group activity. And I want to give you a word. Do you know that being listened to is so close to being loved that I really can't tell the difference. Most people can't tell the difference. That when I'm really listened to, it feels so close to being loved, I can't tell the difference. So we've designed in this format today for you to listen to another person, another person to listen to you. Because I discover that in a place of safety and a real listening ear, God uses that person to take me beyond the veil. And things open up to me. So on this page, you have now entered the passion zone. I think passion, I think you have to check in every now and then in ministry to ensure that you're doing your passion. I think that the older you get or the more or the longer you're in ministry, the tendency for many of us is to move away from our passion more and more and more and more. And we have to check in every now and then to make sure that what we're doing, we are passionate about. So you have now entered the passion zone. You see there on that first paragraph what we're talking about it's the inside out model. I give you the basics of it. We must acknowledge Jesus Christ at the, inner, at the inner core of our being. And this acceptance at our inner core, we come to know what we believe to be true. Only when we know we do, what we know is true do we come to know what we really want. What, what we really want, our passion becomes clear. Once our passion is clear, we locate a deep need in the world and we discover the joy of vocation of what many of us know as call. Upon the discovery, we partner with God with work for our head and our hearts and our hands to do. We implement our passion. What gives us deep joy meets a deep need in the world and the experience is a deep gladness. I believe this version of the Bible, the message I really love, Galatians 6 and 4, this is our guiding scripture. Make a careful exploration of who you are and the work that you have been given and then sink yourself into that. Don't be impressed with yourself. Don't compare yourself with others. Each of us, I love this, that's why it's in italics, must take responsibility for doing the creative best you can with your own life. You must take responsibility to do the creative best. I love that word. We'll talk about it a little bit later. The creative best you can, which means your journey might not look like anybody else's journey. There's a uniqueness about you, a specialness about you. And you have the responsibility to nurture and develop that uniqueness and that specialness. And while you're doing that, all kind of forces will arise to take you off your uniqueness and your specialness. And when you come off your uniqueness and your specialness, your passion will wane. And you have all of the trappings. You have a doctor, a PhD behind your name. You'll have tons of stuff, but you'll discover that you don't like it when you get up in the morning. So each of us has a responsibility to creatively shape and live our own life. And there comes a point when we must make the choice to live our passion. For me, it was leaving passion. I could have stayed there and written it out. But what does writing out do for my life? it takes me further and further away from my passion. I could have stayed and rested on old laurels, but no, I have to create a way so I can release my passion. I have to do that. Nobody's gonna do that for me. So I also wanna talk about this piece called confessional theology. You see, I, I'm on a journey with the passion. I, I, um, how I wrote this was um, when I got up after uh, in the plan, I, I developed a plan to leave Mississippi Boulevard Christian Church. I got up on July 2nd, the book opens with me standing in front of the congregation saying, I'm gonna retire as of December 30th, 2012. 
And um, the congregation, you know, people, is there anything wrong? This might put you out, you know, I just fight, you know, usually. No, I just want to do something else with my life. I've been doing this for 31 years. I want to do something else with my life. I don't enjoy this. Nobody's bad. Nobody. Y'all couldn't make me enjoy it if you tried. <laughs> because it's not about you all. It's about my passion, right? So they organized a retirement banquet for me. 800 people bought tickets to my retirement banquet. I was so deeply impressed with the fact that 800 people would buy tickets. I mean, expensive ticket, dress up, gowns, and all that kind of stuff. I realized that as, as I was preaching, I preached my way to the decision. If you take the front of your book, you see there's an iceberg in the top, right? The iceberg is the sermon. All this thought, emotion, and feeling, and depth is underneath the sermon. What they heard was the sermon. They had no idea all this stuff that was going on underneath me. So in a the book, there's a sermon called Have To Versus Want To. Where did that sermon come from? I'm trying to make a decision. Do I have to do this or do I want to do this? On Mother's Day. Right? So they don't hear all that. So I said, out of a sense of appreciation for you all and all that you've gifted me with, I'm going to do a book. I'm going to put the 15 sermons, and then I'm going to put the backstory so you really can see and understand and know and feel. And that's my thank you. Well, I couldn't, I was going to do 800 copies. It was going to be my gift. I was going to give it to everybody, but I couldn't get it written. It was too much grief. I was grieving and leaving and grieving and leaving and crying and leaving and trying to move and what's next and blah, blah, blah. As soon as I got out, I began to work on this. Put it together, and when I put it together, all of a sudden, people started gravitating to it. Not that I was shocked, but I was shocked. I was shocked that Dr. Bill Lee's congregation ate this up. We want you to come back. We want you to come back again. Teach us more about this passion. What's, you know, teach us about this passion. An important part of it is what I call confessional theology. So I don't know if you know G. Alfred Smith. He is a senior mentor in the African American community, a much a huge figure, father figure to a whole lot of us. I gave him a copy of the book. He, next, a week later, he wrote me a three-page letter and called it confessional theology. I didn't know it was confessional theology. That's what he called it. So he wrote me a three-page letter. I put the three-page letter in the second version of the book that you know as, I think it's the foreword or something. Confessional theology, let me give you the sum total of it. I'm on page 75. I invite you into relationship with me as a wrestling, struggling, and limping human being and offer you space for your own confusions and struggles to resonate. Not as shameful and embarrassing things, but as heroic or valid parts of the faith journey. So the book is transparent. You've got that figured out. Yes, you have a question? Yes, come on. Hello, I'm Tiffany Thomas. I'm not sure if you're open for a question. I apologize if I'm. Well, you're up now, so let's do it. <laughs> Yes. My confusion is, what is the role of God in this choice? Thank you so much. That's a wonderful question. My, my wife asked me the same thing. So my wife said, uh, her way of saying that was, what is God saying to you about this? The exact same, that's exactly what she said to me. I said, um, this is what I thought I heard God say. That I had been faithful for 31 years. And so God said, you make the choice. You can go if you want to, or you can stay if you want to. Now, I reoriented my theology because I thought that God only had one plan for my life, and I was supposed to live out that plan. What I now think, this is dangerous theology, but this is not what I think and feel, is that God has an infinite number of futures for me, and God and I can co-create my future together. So I get a choice in the future that I want to have. And God and I develop. Now, I say to you, that's different theology than much of what is said in the church, because we're trained to think one call, and our job is to find that call. 
But I say to you, I'm at the point in my life, and maybe just where I am, God said, you were faithful. And so now, make a choice. And so we, we and God and I are now are co-creating this thing I'm doing now. Teaching, preaching, talking about the choice, helping younger clergy. And I'm so excited and fired up about it. Okay, that was a great question. Being listened to is so close to being loved that I can't tell the difference. If I confess, if I open up and show you that I don't have it all together, you give me a great gift to listen to me. Because if you listen to me, I mean, if you really listen to me, I mean, if you really listen to me, it's so close to being loved, I can't tell the difference. I can't tell the difference between being loved and being listened to. I mean, really listened to. So I want you to really listen in these groups when you go, to really listen to another person. And you will love them deeply and they'll experience it as love and we'll have a fabulous day. And you'll say how good the, the presenter was and it's not the presenter, it's the fact that somebody cared enough to really listen. So um, go to page 80 real quick on Stickman Overview. You see that right there on page 80. You will be filling out. For me, it's a three-step process. The first is, what do you know to be true? What is it, what's really true? Not what you say is true, but what do you know at your core? What do you know that 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 you really know that you know? So really knowing is when um, you do what we did. Uh, my wife was called back for a second mammogram. The first mammogram found something. So the doctors called us back. And so we sat in the waiting room. And you could tell what kind of news people got by how they came out. And we got it closer and closer and closer and closer to the door. When we got in, they put the thing, the breast, the lump on the screen, and we're in terror, prayer terror. And the doctor says, we don't think it's cancerous. And so we walk out. What if the doctor had said, what if the doctor said to you that you have cancer? What do you tell yourself to get up and walk out of that room? You have to tell yourself something. You have to speak to yourself. What do you, so we have these great intellectual theological treatises that we write on our theology. Your real theology is what you tell yourself to get up is called core belief. What do I believe at the bedrock and the core of my soul? Often, you discover it in a crisis. The second part is what do I want really? Not what do I want. I know what we want. We want fame, power, sex, money, many of us. What do you want really? The word really implies another kind of wanting. So people say, I want a spouse. Okay, but what's underneath that? What's underneath that is I want a companion. So companionship is a value. You see, what you want really is a value. Usually it's not about cars or money or material things or fame or approval. Many times it sounds like peace, joy. What do you want really? Once you discover what you know to be true, it's connected to what you want really. Then out of what you want really, then we come to What's my passion? What would I do if nobody paid me? What do I do for the love of the game? Michael Jordan had a clause in his contract, the first in NBA history. NBA players would sign a contract that they couldn't play on concrete courts. They couldn't play in certain places because of the insurance risk. The insurance company put it in. Michael Jordan said, no, 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 I play when I want, where I want, if I want. I play for the love of the game. They put in his contract the love of the game clause. I play when I want to. I love this. I don't play for money. Now, pay me. 
he said about owner Jerry Reinsdorf, he's a businessman. He don't know anything about the love of the game. What do you do for the love of the game? And then, for the love of the game, how does that connect with a deep need in the world? Then you discover joy. All this is on page uh, 80, and if you finish the process today, we'll have, um, hopefully, have worked through, and you'll get to respond to all of those uh, questions. I want to start and go back to the question that you're going to discuss now. It's called, uh, What Do I Know to Be True? Um, and it's about core beliefs and core values. And so let me share this with you. And then at 9.30, I think it's 9.30, uh, we're going to break out in, into groups. I got this concept of core belief from Henry H. Mitchell and uh, Nicholas Kupaluder in their book, Soul Theology. They define core belief as the bedrock attitudes that govern all deliberate behavior and relationship and also all spontaneous responses to crisis. Core beliefs are our working opinions about whether God can be trusted. Core beliefs are our working opinions about whether God can be trusted. They have been acquired through life experience, through worship, through cultural exposure, and they can be altered likewise. Core beliefs are not mere propositions to which assent is given. They are the ways that one trusts or fails to trust. They are embraced intuitively and emotionally without often the ability to express them rationally. They are most authentically expressed, Cooper, Luter, and Mitchell say, uttered spontaneously in crisis. Core beliefs in this sense are the ways in which one trusts or fails to trust, whom one trusts or whom one fails to trust. We all have life and cultural experiences that shape belief, what and whom we trust and do not trust. It is these beliefs that form the foundation for all our behavior and relationships. Every living, breathing human being has core belief. What I've noticed is that many people, particularly preachers, don't know their core belief. So we've designed this exercise to take you. I recount them or this situation of core belief. In our clothes, I was a pastor, I told you that. I was at home at one o'clock in the afternoon, the phone rang on a Monday afternoon, and they said there is a, the clerk was a member of the church and said, there's a lawsuit down here with your name on it. A lawsuit with my name on it? He said, yeah, it's, it has your name, the name of Mississippi Boulevard. My name? So I um, went down there and got it, got a copy of it, and surely it was there. And so um, it, I had no way to, to shape it, you know what I mean? It's like, didn't the Bible say in 1 Corinthians 14, this is, there's a trustee, a trustee. So my phone started to blow up. There's a preacher in town who would, any uh, newspaper uh, stuff about any pastor, he would circulate it to all the other pastors. So by Monday evening, I was on 579. They wanted interviews. The next morning, the newspaper, it was all over the place. Friends called me, phones blowing up. I'm in shock. I don't know, I'm in shock. I just don't know what to do. I mean, I'm in shock. Okay, what to do? So um, I got to preach Sunday. So now I'm in shock Monday and Tuesday, and Wednesday and Thursday I'm depressed. Embarrassed, depressed, uh, trying to explain it, trying to help the church see a way forward, trying to be positive, uh, and I'm depressed. So um, what do I preach? I know what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to call Bill Lee and have him come here preach on Sunday. Well, that's chicken and out. I couldn't do that. Did y'all have a, in, in school, when I, when I grew up in school, they used to announce fights on the playground at 3 o'clock. Did y'all have that? They would say, 
Frank and Bill, they fell out in recess, but they're going to sell it at 3 o'clock. And it spread through the whole school, right? So at 3 o'clock, everybody waiting around to see what's going on. That was the atmosphere that it took. People were coming to church to see what was going to happen. Place was packed to the rafters. I'm telling you, everybody named Mama in the city of Memphis came to church that Sunday to see what was, what do I preach? Do I preach, ye whitewashed tombs, ye workers of iniquity? And then tell them, I wasn't, they say, you were talking about us. No, I, I was just preaching the Bible. I wasn't calling any names. <laughs> you know what came to me? Preach what you most deeply believe about the character of God. What is it that I most deeply believe about God? What is God's essence? What is God's character? And so, with the place packed to the hill, I preached my core belief. I preached the text. It says, our God is so full of compassion. With the folks waiting for a schoolyard fight, newspaper and television in tow, I preached our God is so full of compassion. I preached the mercy and the compassion of God because at my core belief, I believe that God is a compassionate and a merciful God. And I offer this to you, the more trouble you in, in ministry, and if you're not in trouble now, you will get in trouble. In trouble, go to what you most deeply believe about God. What is it that you most deeply believe? What is the essence of God's character? What do you know that you know? So if the doctor would have said, and maybe there'll be a point that the doctor will say, cancer in my life. And I'll have to say something. Because when you hear the C word in your life, it's, I'll have to say, I believe that I will say, the God I serve is full of mercy and compassion. And it's the compassion and the mercy of God that will get me out of that doctor's office. <laughs>